has served as uh, chairman of the Virginia uh, Board of Historic Resources in Richmond. And he's going to talk to us this afternoon about Tuckahoe Plantation, the boyhood home of Thomas Jefferson. And I don't know what all else he may bring up, but uh, he may give some remarks also about the work of the Virginia Department of Historic Resources that might be of interest to us. But without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Chad Thompson. Well, we're going to have a visit to Tucker House. Um, we're going to talk about the grounds in the house and, uh, and other things. Some of you may have been to Tucko on Garden Week. After um, Sue and I moved in in 1977, we opened in 1979. It's been open every year since then except for one. And uh, on the cover twice, I think. This is our last time on the cover. That's a picture of the wonderful uh, flowers around the old kitchen. We'll see more of that. Here's a familiar picture on the cover of my sister's book that she wrote. It started as a thesis for her in Wellesley College, and my parents published it. And just to show you, things haven't changed a whole lot, except we got rid of a lot of vines that were growing on the north porch there, um, and other vines that grew up chimneys. We are a National Historic Landmark, which puts us in the top uh, few percent of historic sites in America. And that came in really handy when it came time to uh, fight the highway. More about that later. And this is one reason I'm here, Bob Montague, <laughs> in front of one of his favorite automobiles in Urbana. Other reasons I'm here, this is my great-grandfather, Thomas Ball. He was a prominent lawyer in Texas, an attorney general, assistant attorney general before the war. After that, he was a sort of subsistence uh, waterman and everything, and duck hunting guy. Uh, living over here in the Northern Neck at Crestfield. And one of his clients was Alfred I. DuPont, who wanted to use some of his products and shoot ducks. And uh, so he would get on the steamer in Baltimore and come down to Harding's Wharf and walk uh, and stay there. Sometimes he would walk a mile down the road to have dinner with my great-grandfather, who, by the way, was married to um, <coughs> Lala Gresham from uh, King and Queen County. And if you're interested, uh, she wrote, she wrote a letter, we've turned it into a little paper, we've turned it into a, a reminiscences of her plantation life uh, up in between the swamps. <clears throat> um, so Mr. DuPont would come down and go duck hunting, and on occasion he'd have dinner at uh, the Ball's house at Crestfield, and he met the Ball children. The oldest was uh, later a lawyer, then there were the three daughters and the baby boy, uh, Ed Ball. And, uh, this was the middle daughter, Jessie Duball, who was Mr. DuPont's third wife. And that's how I came to um, be at Tucko. She liked to preserve historic places the old-fashioned way, so she bought them. <laughs> uh, and she was also very prominent on the board of uh, the Robert E. Lee Foundation and spent many years happy times uh, in the lofts there in the, when they used to have their meetings in, in the... Um, domestic quarters there, um, but she bought for herself Ditchley, which is now a cider, being turned into a cider works outside of Kilmarnock. She bought, helped my grandmother buy Tuckahoe, and uh, the younger sister, Elsie, uh, bought a place outside of Tappahannock. And they're my parents, uh, my grandparents, <coughs> her older sister, Isabel, my grandmother, and my grandfather, for whom I'm named, Nehemiah Addison Baker a ninth generation Mayflower descendant. So my parents could never talk about the Civil War because uh, he was the Yankee and uh, on my <clears throat> um, father's side were the Confederates. My parents, Dr. William T. Thompson and Jesse Gresham Baker Thompson, and they kept the place going for many years. And then the current generation is yours truly, my wife Sue, brother-in-law Andy, sister Jesse who wrote the book, and my brother T and his wife Carrie. And so we've been carrying on the place uh, ever since Arm and Pop died. Now this is an aerial view of Tuckyho. <clears throat> and up at the top you can see River Road. It stretches all the way from River Road. These are our open fields. And all of the open fields of Tuckyho are now protected in perpetuity by conservation easements. And here's the historic complex of the main house, the Plantation Street. And all of those buildings are also protected by historic uh, 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 easements and, and in the house, even the interior is protected. 
we have uh, sort of the farm side of the property, and that's the CSX Railroad <coughs> and, uh, on, and the low grounds. And uh, here's a sort of a zoom in of the main house, the historic Plantation Street with the buildings you'll see more of, and the gardens off to the east. And here's a view <coughs> from just to the west of the house looking down across the low grounds. This view is also protected by conservation easements that cover the property south of the railroad all the way to the James River. There it is in winter with our wonderful uh, seating, outside seating. As you approach the house, you come through the, uh, the gate there and our little honor box, uh, we were open for anybody that walks up and we ask that they make a $5 donation, and many do, closer and closer. And there's the schoolhouse. This was obviously in the spring and there are daffodils. What you don't recognize when you approach is that this house is H-shaped. So it's over twice, maybe twice as big as it looks from the front. So you have the older part that was built first <coughs> with the T, the uh, freestanding T-shaped chimney laid up in the uh, glazed headers and the uh, Flemish bond. <coughs> the newer end, this pole piece here, the T, at the set for the south was hitched on to was already there with the uh, built into the wall chimney again, the, the, um, the Flemish bond. And one story is that uh, William Randolph uh, maybe had a chimney fire and uh, so he built the chimney uh, into the brick wall to avoid future problems. Now here's some of the evidence you can See, I don't know, you probably can't see it from there, but this is looking at the dining room window, part of the T that was hitched on. Both of the <coughs> corner boards there are straight lines indicating that was built as a unit, whereas <coughs> on the left side, this edge was curved or cut out to accommodate what was already there. And it's curious <coughs> that uh, here, of course, they didn't have any choice but to uh, um, they weren't going to move the window, so, uh, but on the other side they did the same thing um, for the sake of symmetry. This is an early Georgian house and symmetry was very important to the Georgian eye. And so on this side where they could have had more space along the wall before you got to the window, they duplicated it for the sake of symmetry. Now, <coughs> um, Marilyn said to tell you some stuff about construction of old houses. And this is a kind of funny slide. Um, in the upstairs hall, it got subdivided, and that's, there are actually two bedroom, two bathrooms off this one hall that uh, now serves as a bedroom. And in that little um, room there, it's, uh, we, there, believe it or not, there are seven doors off this little room that's barely uh, six feet by 10 feet. You can see the one here, of course, two, three, four into the rest of the south hall. Then there's a closet and then the <coughs> a door to the attic. And so we're going to go up in the attic to show you when they built the north end, <coughs> it, they, maybe they didn't intend it to stay all that long. Um, these are barely uh, four by fours. And you can see there's no ridge pole. The bright white wood that you see <coughs> were uh, repairs after Hurricane Isabel um, um, actually interrupted 27 of the 29 um, uh, rafter uh, jo joist connections on the north side of that roof. It's amazing it didn't collapse. <clears throat> and then co contrast that with the new part, and it's built like a, a fortress, literally. Um, these dimensions are like eight or nine inches, and cross uh, trust and everything with, with more of that, more of the same. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> um, Sue's a big uh, flower decorator, but these steps lead up to the roof. <clears throat> and so we think there probably was a widow's walk out there. And maybe that's uh, something that Th little Thomas Jefferson, when he was growing up, uh, saw that his, uh, his um, cousin and, his, uh, and when his father was the overseer, could go up the steps and outside and look out and see the work on the low grounds down below. And we have all heard the stories about how Thomas Jefferson would walk out on the veranda west of uh, Monticello and see what was happening with his spyglass at the University of Virginia. So maybe another, a little influence on Jefferson there. And there, of course, is the Thomas Jefferson schoolhouse that still exists, where Jefferson started his studies from the time he was able to go to school. He got at Tucko when he was two, 
So his early instructional lecture was on that journey from Shadwell, where he was born, down to Tuckhoe in uh, 1745, and he stayed for um, seven years until 1752. And here he is, um, with Sue and me. Some of you may have run into Bill Barker uh, from the Colonial Williamsburg, who's a great uh, Thomas Jefferson impersonator. Uh, so we'll talk a little more about some of the influences of the house, especially, for instance, here is what the ceiling of the schoolhouse originally looked like, and the office had still has, this is the original ceiling, it starts out with this elaborate cornice and a tray ceiling, it goes up to a pyramidal dome. So there you have Jefferson's first dome that he enjoyed as a student in the little schoolhouse there. And the only practical reason I can think why they might have done that was that they went to school in the summertime because the teacher was also the parson and he had to ride over so he quit coming in the winter, he only came in the summer. Um, <clears throat> this is the yard out in front of the house uh, with the smokehouse and storehouse and a view today to show you that except for a lot, it seems like a lot more trees, it hasn't changed much. Um, and then here's the floor plan of the house <coughs> with, uh, it's basically a four over four <coughs> separated by this hyphen or great hall and we've sort of seen a little bit of that only they left out the details upstairs where the uh, bathrooms were added in that uh, little uh, hall of seven doors. Going inside the house, if you look back, you'll uh, see this elaborate staircase with the uh, carved tread under each um, stair tread, the carved detail, a carved landing uh, up there, and then uh, here's an older picture of the real masterpiece with the canvas leaf and basket a modern picture, and uh, we used to say that uh, um, <clears throat> William Randolph did this to make his bride and bride, Judith Page, feel more at home because Rosewell was this wonderful house. Um, but to me, the real question is, if you're one of the prominent families of Virginia, the Randolphs, and you're adding on to a house in uh, 17, late 20s, 30s, why didn't you build it in brick? And so my theory is that uh, you had this craftsman coming over, maybe they were behind in their construction at Rosewell, and he's telling you about all the stuff he's going to do. And being, uh, you know, uh, Virginians a little skeptical, they say, yeah, show us. So, uh, so Thomas Mann Page says, well, you know, Randolph, you take him and see what he can do. So he comes up to Tucko and puts in this amazing <coughs> staircase and carving, more stuff we're going to see in the paneling and it's too good to tear down. So now Randolph has to add on to the house instead of tearing down and starting to break. <laughs> Going off to uh, the northwest corner of the house, a right turn around the staircase, um, and we have the white parlor. Um, it's decorated with, I mentioned the Thomas Ball, the, the uh, lawyer, who lived, he lived in California. <clears throat> um, from 1933 until his death in 1960, he commuted from uh, San Marino to downtown in, the 19, in his 1933 Pierce era V12 coupe. I'm sure did his part to add to the smog in Los Angeles. But he collected um, <clears throat> this, he was a big fan of uh, Napoleon and the Code Napoleon, which is the basis for California law. And so we have all this French furniture in there. Curious, and there's Henry Clay, the uh, great compromiser, who uh, did the compromise of 1820 and 50. But here you can see how um, we have alcoves on either side of the fireplace where the paneling falls around and it makes a nice place to hang these uh, pictures, very elaborate uh, um, shelf over the mantel. Always this idea of uh, pilaster or columns, um, which you'll see more of. Uh, and in that far corner that was the window was this curious date, March 16, 1789, and we'll see more of that. That was the date of the death of Thomas Mann Randolph's first wife, Anne Carey of Emptill, who bore him 13 children in the middle of the 18th century. Across the hall is the so-called burnt room, and here we have uh, the desk that supposedly came over with William uh, Randolph of Turkey Island and Mary, Mary Aisha, the Adam and Eve, and Eve of Virginia, and it's supposedly on that desk that uh, William Randolph wrote his will <coughs> Um, that named Peter Jefferson guardian of his estate and his children. They were such good friends that when Peter wanted to move to the north bank of the James River, he talked to his, he already, I guess, had bought Shadwell, but he wanted some more land. So um, 
uh, William sold him <coughs> uh, 400 acres that were added to the property for the biggest bowl of Eric Punch that could be had at Weatherford's Tavern in Williamsburg. So watch out. <coughs> um, there's, of course, George Washington. My grandmother very proud of that, being a ball, the same family as his mother. And that's a, a peel monochrome. The, the, the color one you know is in the White House. You see it on TV a lot. Apparently they didn't pay him much, and so he did 60 or 70 of these monochromes and sold them to make some money. And over here is the fireplace end of the room. Again, a nice shelf. Here they uh, are modernizing a little bit and saving on uh, materials, so they take the uh, paneling straight across the fireplace end, and in this case use it for a barrel. These nice uh, uh, cabinets with a butterfly cutout shelf and barrel wall top. And then I'm going to zoom in on <coughs> the very elaborate cornice and again the pilaster with a nice Corinthian capital on it. And this maybe was Jefferson's first introduction to uh, classical architecture because um, here you have <coughs> the roof structure of the Greek temple, the column with the capital holding up the cornice that holds up the roof. Mm -hmm. And you've got all the names of the sign erected and this and that. And, which was also designed to make the rain when it came down the roof uh, drop straight to the ground because that straight line there, the rain had no choice but to go straight to the ground instead of staying on the side of the building up through the Great Hall. And uh, <clears throat> this is what makes Tucko unique in the eighth shape. And uh, there's, I like to point out to the tourists there's something very important missing in this room <clears throat> for year-round living. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Fireplace. Yeah, there's no fireplace, so they had no way to heat this great hall or the great stair halls. You can see the south stair hall uh, through the archway there. And uh, this was something that Thomas Jefferson decidedly did not like. You know, when you, it, I'm sure most of you have been to Monticello. You come in the north door <coughs> and there's this wonderful reception hall and there's a fireplace. But guess what? No staircase. You see the rail, the walkway with the railing up on the second floor, but you can't get there from here. So uh, <clears throat> Jefferson thought that your house should be practical and subject to being able to live in year round. And this uh, certainly wasn't, but certainly this room helped our region earn the reputation it enjoys for Southern hospitality, um, because that's what it was designed for, uh, for folks uh, in the social season traveling around and going to these nice functions. And we don't feel so bad because you probably know Stratford Hall in Westmoreland County has a great hall also that has no fireplace. So we're in good company. This is uh, looking from the south entrance hall, which is actually the, the main hall, of the, the main entrance to the house that faces the James River. Most people probably did come by the street, although from 1814 until 1880 to get there on the canal boat from downtown Richmond. <clears throat> But here they had a little bit of a problem because they wanted this nice big door with the lighted transom <coughs> over it. Um, but if they'd done like the north end, they would have cut off the doorway. Plus, you would have been looking at the back of the door when you came in the house, which uh, is sort of a slap <coughs> in the face, according to you, sort of like the pineapple was a symbol of uh, hospitality. You wanted to be looking up the staircases when you came in. And so this was the solution. The stairway starts just before you go into the dining room <clears throat> and has this uh, sort of piece cutting across. Much simpler, no carved tread, you know, detail under each tread anymore, no carved landing. Um, <clears throat> but I mentioned about that door. This was uh, Jefferson's introduction to Palladian architecture. It's uh, from a combination of uh, <clears throat> books uh, called Palladio Londonensis published in London design book, and that's what these builders did. They didn't have architects, but they had design books and they copied things, and this door got copied, <coughs> and uh, probably was the door before they added onto the house and just moved it on down to the south end. And so uh, you can imagine little uh, Thomas Jefferson getting this imprint of this wonderful design, perhaps waiting to get out and play. And there's a, a, a fanciful portrait by David Silvett, a popular portraitists that <coughs> painted many of the modern governors, their portraits hanging in the state capitol. That's kind of weird, a little door um, <coughs> leads under the staircase down to the full English basement under the south end of the house. And that's something that Thomas Jefferson did like. 
if you, any of you ever been to the third floor of, um, or the second floor at Monticello, well, you know to get there, <coughs> um, you have to, I already alluded to the difficulty of getting up there, you uh, go in the dining room, there's a little panel door out of the dining room, leads to a back hall and then a crooked stair, and that's how you get to the second floor of Monticello. So he liked this, and probably because, like Pavlov's dog, uh, dogs, the, uh, the <coughs> adults were eating around the corner in the dining room, and kids probably went down to uh, where the plates were being assembled down below to have their, their uh, dinner. And so he, he liked that. Across from the stairway is this um, a nice place to, where we usually have a very nice uh, flower decoration that uh, Sue enjoys doing. But behind it is this amazing mirror that my grandmother collected. <coughs> um, and more about that in a minute. <coughs> but um, some of you may have, uh, may be familiar with Tucker through the story of the Patriot. <coughs> they called it uh, Riverton, the home of the Fries of Guzman County. And the only thing they got right about that is it is in Goodson County. I hope you'll remember that it is a Randolph home. Um, starring Jack Ward of Hawaii Five-O fame. <coughs> so uh, the only interior uh, shot in the movie was uh, in front of that mirror when uh, Mrs. Fry was fixing her hat before uh, um, seeing him off to Williamsburg. Um, now we're over in the southeast sitting room, so we're almost uh, at the end of the house tour, but not quite. Um, <clears throat> this has a particularly uh, elaborate um, mantle with this wonderful sunburst medallion <clears throat> um, in the center. And again, the pilasters, you can kind of see that we can't have a, a room without a pilaster in it. Um, <clears throat> in the, uh, and so Gabrielle probably did all these more about her. Uh, a little bit later, <clears throat> but uh, obviously she did a great job there. And now that we're in the new end of the house, <clears throat> the idea from the burnt room with the paneling going straight across is here utilized for closets on either side. Still not, not a lot of closets um, and closet space. Here's this uh, little green settee here. It's supposed to have been made on the place by enslaved Africans. And uh, it has rather straight legs at the back and if it were not propped up against the wall, you don't want to lean back or you go over with it. <clears throat> this piece on the left, this huge break front, is a real masterpiece in terms of furniture. <clears throat> the three sisters <clears throat> went over to England in the year of the Three Kings, 1936, when King George V died, and then uh, the, uh, the Prince of Wales um, abdicated and George VI came to the throne all in that same year. And they went on a shopping spree to furnish <coughs> all the three houses uh, that, that uh, Jesse Ball had purchased for them. And the story is that my uh, the younger sister, Elsie, uh, bought this to go in her house in uh, McGill Terrace in Washington, D.C. And my grandmother bought a slightly smaller one, figuring out what probably would happen. It wouldn't fit <coughs> in the house in Washington, D.C., so it came here to Tuckahoe instead and it exactly fits between the inside of the door and the corner over there. And uh, <clears throat> we've had a lot of movie shoots uh, since the story of Patriot, starting in 1995 with the broken chain <laughs> um, about the uh, Indians and uh, the settlers in upstate New York. And in one scene, the Indians had just raided the house and they took every stitch of furniture out of the house, of the first floor of the house, and stored it in trucks out on the lawn, except for that. <coughs> um, they left that one and built a wall to enclose it <laughs> and uh, did a great job. M um, and of course, uh, my grandmother lived there during the war, so you have people like, you probably can't see it, but there's Eisenhower, MacArthur, and all the rest of them are Churchill. She's a big fan of Winston Churchill, and of course, had Randolph Fort Bears also. Um, now we're over <coughs> at the, uh, the dining room, and uh, same idea with uh, the closet. There's actually a dumb waiter in there. Maybe another idea that Jefferson picked up on, although we can't. Uh, there was some correspondence about it being repaired, so we're not sure. But I think it must have existed in the 18th century because there's no other way to get the food to that dining room without coming in the front door. And they certainly wouldn't have done that. They had a, the basement underneath, which was probably like a scullery that I was mentioning that was where TJ and the kids ate. <clears throat> um, 
I'm going to focus over on this window here. And here's some more window etching, which is another testament to the fact that Tucko is, is not a restoration, it's a, a conservation, and, uh, and even the, many of the window panes are original. This one has the name of Mary Randolph Tuckahoe, March 20, 1780. We think that was the date of her engagement party. She married her first cousin, David B. Randolph, later that fall. And <coughs> he was supposed to get a nice appointment from Thomas Jefferson uh, as the postmaster general. It didn't work out, so they uh, turned to inkeeping instead. And she ended up writing the first Virginia cookbook called Virginia Housewife. Later, her son, a uh, naval academy, a naval ship, uh, midshipman, fell from the rigging and was severely injured. He, she spent decades looking care for him, and she ended up being the first non-league interred at Arlington House. If you go to the right side of the house as you look at it, you'll see her own little uh, uh, cemetery there. There's a Colonel Ball, <coughs> um, and he was having a great time because he wrote his name, you see, three more times, First Virginia Res Regiment. And I'm sure when my grandmother saw that, that clinched the sale when she bought the place in 1935. <clears throat> this is maybe the oldest window painting, Mariah Horseman and Bird of Westover. And the historians tell me that she died in 1744. There's the ghost. Here we are in the dining room. Some guests came to visit in the uh, early 1990s, and this gal took a picture and, and was amazed at this apparition, and, and the, before the picture faded, you could see two blue eyes and lips and a nose, literally, <laughs> and that's faded. So uh, we actually have a picture of a ghost, and we do have some nice ghost stories. We have the gray lady, we have two candidates for the gay, gray lady, um, and uh, one that turned out, uh, I guess my grandmother kind of sanitized some of these tales, <clears throat> but one of them was supposed to be John Marshall's grandmother, Mary Hysham. Uh, Randolph. <coughs> um, she had an older brother, William, and a younger sister um, who married a man later, uh, William Stitt, um, President William Mary, following on his father. In any event, <coughs> the story we always heard was she ran off with an overseer, uh, actually from Dungeness, and they had a baby, they were married, <coughs> and the Randolphs didn't like that, so Brother William sort of headed up a posse, went up to Elk Island in the middle of the James River, killed the husband and the baby, and brought her back to Tucko, mm -hmm. and forced her to marry a clergyman, 17 years her, uh, her age, and uh, she never had any fun after that. And so <laughs> she might wander around to join the party at Tucko, so don't have too much fun. That's not it at all. After she came back to Tucko, she, of course, had severe mental problems after having her husband and son murdered in front of her. She came back, and, uh, <laughs> and then she became a friend of uh, the Reverend James Keith, who was uh, uh, then the head muckety-muck of Henrico, um, you know, Shire, and Henrico Vestry, and, and all that, and big, almost a bishop, I guess you could say. And they fell in love and also fell into bed and were discovered in the middle of uh, of the act in bed, uh, I forget the Latin expression for it, but in any event, the Randolphs weren't too pleased, and so uh, they got uh, <coughs> Keith uh, uh, resigned from uh, the head of the Henrico Parish and sent him off to Catholic Maryland, and that might have been the end of it, except for Commissary Blair, who had gone to school in Scotland with his father, <coughs> and he interceded and came to believe that uh, Keith and uh, and Mary Isham Randolph were truly in love. And uh, so when she came of age, <coughs> they were permitted to marry, and they got in a church up in Fauquier County, and they had eight children. One of them was uh, Tom Marshall, father of John Marshall. And uh, he, he was a good friend of Washington. They were all land surveyors. They all fought the war. Tom and his sons, uh, John Marshall, and a couple of the younger sons as well. Later in life, uh, this man, um, uh, Enoch Arden, who she had run off with, was reported to be alive, and that freaked her out, because it meant maybe her marriage to uh, Keith wasn't legal, and uh, so she had severe mental problems toward the end of her life, so she, I guess, could be a ghost again. 
but not, not the one looking to have fun. She obviously was a liberated woman uh, in her youth. <laughs> okay, now we're, uh, uh, and we have more about the other, um, Nancy Randolph, she's the other one. We also uh, uh, have a very friendly ghost story, I'll tell you about that uh, in a few minutes. Now we're in the, uh, <clears throat> the Northwest bedroom. The Coolidge is always called as the master bedroom, but I don't think it was. I'll tell you more about that. Um, it does have a couple of uh, these his and her boudoir Chippendale chairs. The her is slightly lower than his, supposed to be Randolph pieces, and the bed warmer left there by the Jeffersons. <coughs> but, um, and there's all, supposed to be another ghost that comes out of the wall and rocks in that rocking chair. You can barely see them right there. As with the room across the hall, the northeast chamber, you can see how these alcoves upstairs make an irresistible place to stash the beds. Perhaps another idea that Jefferson picked up on because he made famous use of alcove beds, both on the upper floor at Monticello and at his country home in Poplar Forest. This one, uh, unlike all the other rooms in the house, does not have the fancy man uh, shelf over the mantel. It's just a plain um, <coughs> stone surround and trim. And this is, they tell me, this is the way all the mantles would have been when the house was finished in the mid to early uh, 18th century. The shelf didn't become a popular item of, of mantle design until later in the 18th century. And so I'm convinced that this was Nancy Randolph's <coughs> bedroom. She was the, uh, uh, one of the younger daughters uh, and the middle sister of the so-called Bazaar sister. Uh, interesting story, if we have time at the end, I'll tell you more about it. But in any event, <coughs> I can just see her telling Gabriella, her father's second wife, <coughs> uh, to keep her mitts off her mantle. And we're glad that she did, so we still have this. <coughs> okay, and across, uh, looking out the north window uh, to the entrance lane in the circle there, are a couple of mystery signatures. Ella de Treville and her, I guess, relative sister, Eva de Treville, 1865, and you can read the date, March 9th, I guess it was 1865. Um, I'm developing a theory about that. We'll come back to that later. Um, now we're in uh, what I, where uh, Sue and I live, and I think this really is the master bedroom. It has the benefit of uh, passive solar heating because it's facing the south. It also has better ventilation because, <clears throat> remember the picture of the windows in the brick wall through that closet there is a window so it has better ventilation. Um, again we have a shelf over the mantel and again writing on the window pane. This uh, is the Allen window um, <clears throat> after the Randolphs uh, vacated Tucko in the 1820s the whites came along they were descendants of founders of Harvard University they have their own graveyard there. <clears throat> um, they owned it for 20 years before the Allens bought it in 1850. Um, and, uh, and that Allen's owned it until they went broke farming in 1898 when Tucko, <coughs> on square mile of land, went on the auction block and sold uh, uh, to the bank for the foreclosure uh, for $13,000. And 13, I mean 10 uh, Coolidge descendants, uh, who were direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson and the Randolphs of Tucko, each put up $1,300 to buy the place. But back to the Allens, <laughs> um, this is Virginia M. Allen and Richard S. Allen. Uh, Father Joseph, I guess, put it all together. Um, but they owned it until the farm went broke. And Virginia is always the one credited with saving Tucko from the Yankees. When Ulrich Dahlgren came down uh, from Northern Virginia, um, part of a raid to take Richmond from the south, from Peter, uh, and they would across the river, and uh, <coughs> the, uh, the enslaved uh, American, they had to guide them across the river, took them down to the to the rip, uh, to the crossing, and the horses floated away, not because he was a, a liar or a traitor, but because it had been so many floods and a lot of rain. Well, uh, Ulrich, Ulrich Dahlgren wasn't too sympathetic and hanged him. After that, he didn't get much help from the locals. Came on down, uh, burned Eastwood just near Tuckahoe, and was going to burn Tucko was the thought, so the story is Virginia Allen struck, uh, put on her best ball gown because she had met Dahlgren at a ball at West Point, and just to make sure, strapped a couple of pistols to her hips 
and went out to greet him and his, his troopers when they rode up to the lawn and he recognized her so he stopped uh, for tea and didn't burn the house. <laughs> went on down River Road and ran into the home guard where they had a big skirmish at West Ham and that's a reenactment of it we had a few years ago at Tuckahoe and further on down to King and Queen where he was finally ambushed and killed not too far from here. <clears throat> Um, there's, in, uh, in the master bedroom, there's that uh, mystery couple again, Ella and Eva B. de Treville. <laughs> Across the hall is the southwest bedroom where our um, boys grew up. And uh, there you can see uh, <laughs> the closet there that actually is a water closet, a half bath. Again, a mantle over the, uh, uh, the, the uh, shelf over the mantle. And one of the most in interesting window panes in the house, <coughs> this is, uh, these are the Bazaar sisters. Here's Nancy, <coughs> um, I mean, excuse me, Judith the oldest, Nancy and Jenny, she really wasn't involved. They, you can see they made an X for her because she wasn't big enough or strong enough to write her own name. Again, that same date, March 16, 1789, the death of their mother <coughs> before her father uh, remarried to Gabriella Harvey who grew up at Belvedere House, now the site of uh, Hollywood Cemetery. Um, we'll come back to that story if you want, if we have time at the end. But it's, uh, she's a good candidate for being the gray lady, uh, especially Judith, because uh, um, her sister, Nancy, uh, kind of done her wrong. <laughs> and then we have, uh, on right uh, nearby on the next window pane, Mary Mitchell Allen, born on December 24, 1864 and died uh, 11 months later. Possibly have, uh, the Trevilles were there to console Virginia Allen, her mother. Um, and you saw that date, December 9th, 1865. That probably was about the time that little Mary died. And so Virginia, to uh, <clears throat> remember her daughter, contacted some of her Yankee friends after the war, including, I'm told, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and raised the money to build St. Mary's Church a mile down the road uh, where we attend today. It opened its doors in 1878 and we were uh, privileged to be at Tuckahoe 100 years later and uh, hosted uh, a, a centenary celebration on the lawn of Tuckahoe. Well back to uh, Tuckahoe, we're outside uh, now looking down the plantation street that was featured uh, in the story of a patriot. You might recall the scene when uh, Mrs. Fry says, English goods were ever the best, right there. Uh, that is the, uh, the plantation office with the um, dairy under it, a little basement, the south cabin, north cabin, smokehouse, storehouse. And um, in the early, or in the late 19th or early 20th century, I'm not sure whether it was uh, the Allens or, or the Coolidge's after they bought it from the Allens, turned that into uh, um, initially a kitchen and later um, uh, a residence for the, for the servant and slapped the chimney on, um, just bolted it onto the side of the building. And here's the same view uh, today, just a lot more greenery around, but looking down the plantation street. And now a few steps <coughs> down the street and looking back, uh, <coughs> the old kitchen with our own green roof. It's the only brick structure on the plantation street, so if they had a fire and the roof burned, at least the whole building didn't burn down. And inside, a, uh, <coughs> there's a nice uh, iron door to the oven and a big pot where you could cook uh, the big bad wolf easily. And then this, um, another view with the kitchen looking down the same buildings. At the end is a two-car garage, probably built <coughs> at the end of the 19th century or maybe early 20th century originally as a small stable and converted to a garage. And there it is today with a lot more greenery. <coughs> now we're at the other end of looking down the plantation street toward the south. You can see the old kitchen. We've got the storehouse, smokehouse, north cabin. We just completed a, uh, our third tax act we had on that building. There's some rafters coming down and Turned out about half the thing was eaten up with ten mics, um, but it's been <coughs> restored. Same view today after the restoration. And here we are at the uh, 
south end of the house looking at uh, the river front. You remember the uh, lighted transom over the door with this uh, elaborate um, <laughs> porch and portico. And uh, earlier this year, one Sunday after church, I was having lunch in the sunshine, started poking around with a butter knife and realized that a lot of this uh, um, column was uh, pretty rotten. <coughs> Later, uh, we saw that that was the only thing holding up this whole magnificent structure with the elaborate uh, cornice and even the ceiling of uh, the cornice there uh, of, the, of the portico is paneled, which is the case of all three of our porticos. We have two others on the east and west that are just uh, cantilevered. The only one that doesn't have it is the north end that was probably enlarged later on, <coughs> maybe under the influence of Jefferson and more sort of a Greco-Roman uh, thing. So there's a lot of weight there. <laughs> We got it supported and, uh, and have replaced the columns. So owning these places is always something to repair. Um, in fact, aside from the main house, which has a slate roof, and the schoolhouse and the office have slate roofs, thanks to the Coolidge's in around 1900, that still leaves uh, eight other buildings on Plantation Street that are framed in the painting. Of course, the kitchen that didn't frame, but uh, we still have eight other cedar roofs that that all are about to need replacing right now. Lots of white paint required also. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you want to pass around in, in any way. I, I have a, I bought a bunch of our garden brochures um, that we forgot to pass around at the beginning. But this is the map, or maybe some of you, yeah, here's the map that's on the garden uh, brochure. And as, as I said, you get one of these for the $5 donation and walk around the grounds to your, self, uh, to your heart's content. And if you have a cell phone, there's an app now you can download, um, and, and it, you'll get an interpretation of your uh, cell phone, even if a guy isn't around. You don't get into the house without an appointment. But in any event, there's the house, the Plantation Street we've been visiting with the kitchen, the office, south, north cabin, storehouse, uh, um, smokehouse, two-car garage, shop, um, west cabin, um, and the old stable, the herb garden, um, that's a playhouse. And um, off to the east are the more formal gardens and then the farmyard uh, further east of that. <laughs> um, and so here we are looking into the herb garden from the Plantation Street. Um, the kitchen is just over here to the left <laughs> um, with this nice picket fence. This isn't historic, but it uh, makes a lot of sense right next to the kitchen. Um, we laid this out and, and uh, installed it in 1979, and uh, Sue takes loving care of it all of the time. You can just see the shed end of the old stable. Now we're on the other side of the picket fence looking across uh, the same garden with a well house that uh, probably was wharf uh, in the 18th century, well, late 18th century, 19th century. Again, the cabins <coughs> and the service yard, my grandmother always called it. There's the old stable, another view across the garden, the shed wings that were added um, probably in the um, late 19th century. The central portion originally had a massive hearth structure and a chimney. It might have been uh, Thomas Mann Randolph's uh, forge. He had a forge at Tucko and made iron works. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, and perhaps the big um, stable that, we, that there's evidence of east of the, uh, in the farmyard, Perhaps it burned. In any event, <coughs> uh, they knocked the chimney down and turned it into a stable a lot closer to the house. And today that's uh, our meeting hall, <coughs> where often the groomsmen uh, hang out, <coughs> and sometimes the bands. The far right uh, is now a, uh, we have a handicapped accessible and two um, toilets in there, restrooms. This is our flower uh, room. And sometimes it uh, gets used for uh, our movie productions. Here's uh, some, it was being a, a costume room at one point. Another point, uh, I don't know if any of you all saw Mercy Street. Mm -hmm. In Mercy Street, it was the interior of the slave cabin where the uh, enslaved woman was giving birth. Another time, <clears throat> it was a hospital warden in 1919 fighting the Spanish flu. Okay, we're back. Uh, on the end of Plantation Street with uh, the gardens over there, the kitchen, the office, Sue's uh, little shady garden that she loves, 
a step a, little, a better view of that. You can see the H of the house again. <coughs> um, and we've got our winter guard up for the snow that comes off the roof. <coughs> and uh, looking across the picket fence, this was a giant tulip poplar tree that the Coolidge's planted around 1900 to celebrate that they had a big party in that, that April and all the people came back, folks that could remember great grandpa talking about the construction of the house. They uh, took a train out uh, to the flag stop at Tuckahoe until 1953. You could flag the train down and ride into Main Street Station. So they had this big shindig, planted this tree. <coughs> My uh, grandmother uh, pruned it. You can see these funny elbows on it. Uh, that was in 1956. And the next year, they filmed the story of Patriot. And she was really embarrassed about the way it looked. And you might notice that if you have a chance to see that movie again. Well, in uh, <coughs> Hurricane Isabel, it fell over the roots and all. And you know, a hurricane starts out <coughs> with a northeasterly direction and rotates around until it gets toward the south southeast. Luckily, it waited until the wind. You know, we closed all the shutters and tied them shut because <coughs> uh, we knew it was coming. Um, but the tree fell exactly east-west, right parallel to the, uh, the, the wall of the house. Didn't break a single shutter. Crashed right through this roof, but popped the pilasters, they're those famous pilasters we had everywhere, popped them and the, and the fascia board out, we were able to reuse them. Uh, cracked one of the stone steps, we found a replacement in the, in the, uh, near the Randolph Cemetery, you'll we'll see a picture of, of that cemetery later. And, and uh, I've talked about what it did to the roof, um, just amazing. And you can see today the crease in the walk, the brick walk where the trunk of the tree hit. Uh, amazing force. So uh, Tucko really has a guardian angel or ghost that uh, made that tree fall parallel to the front of the wall. <laughs> um, back again with another view of the south cabin in the springtime, uh, the north cabin. Um, all the daffodils, <laughs> and now we're about to enter the, uh, the formal gardens to the um, east of the house, and this is the gate to the Ghost Walk <laughs> land, originally by um, English box, now American box, and these tree box that are still there. On the other side of the tree box was an amazing boxwood maze about the time that we were fighting the highway department, <laughs> more about that later, um, the English box decline hit. Uh, the box maze and it all died in the late 1960s and 1970s. <clears throat> this is a uh, old Mr. Pilla and my grandparents in the garden using a horse to plow the garden. He was big on vegetables and especially uh, that white uh, squash. Um, and there's the same view pretty much today with uh, the roses and, and their um, more flowers and another view looking head on to the uh, Rose Row and our annual row a little bit further to the west. Uh, you can see the fence there and the, and the front field just uh, to the northeast of the house. Yeah, northeast of the house. Some more uh, architecture in the garden. And now we're in <coughs> uh, what we call the Memorial Garden that uh, my grandmother founded after her um, only son died in 1946, designed by Gillette. <clears throat> and there's the wall of the Randolph Cemetery. And uh, the, uh, <clears throat> um, the Coolidge's, when they first were taking an interest in Monticello, came to Tuckahoe and found this just a pile of rubble. So they rebuilt the wall. There's a date there, it says 1892, when they rebuilt the wall. And uh, Virginia Allen, who was a little elderly by then, the savior of Tuckahoe from the Yankees, wasn't too friendly with them. And so when they rebuilt the wall, <coughs> they didn't put any gates into the cemetery. <laughs> so there's no way to get in there except climb over the wall. Um, <laughs> looking uh, across uh, from another view, um, we're just to the uh, west looking east. There's a sundial, and there's some of the brick walkway. A fence that ends the, the, the uh, plantation closing across the way is a brick barn with a, uh, a slate roof that was a, a two-story bank barn. I think it was probably a wheat threshing barn built by uh, um, John Brokenborough, who was the second husband of 
of Gabriella Harvey, who was the second wife of Thomas Mann Randolph. He was a very rich man. He was the first um, um, president of the Bank of Virginia, <coughs> treasurer of the Bank of Virginia. And uh, he didn't like living in an old frame house, so he built Lower Tuckahoe House just to the east of, uh, of our Tuckahoe, and also <coughs> a townhouse that later served as the White House of the Confederacy. Now we have one more view of the, of the wall, the garden, we're in the north a little bit. This is a pleat starboard that Sue installed a few years back with uh, European hornbeam trees. Uh, it's a very nice feature, and sometimes our brides take advantage of it, including our daughter-in-law for a rehearsal dinner. <clears throat> and now we're looking back across. This, was the, this is the gravesite of uh, my uncle I never knew, who's inspired my grandmother to f start that garden. Off in here, you can just barely see some green grass and these back of the schoolhouse, that's where the, uh, where the boxwood maze was. And then we lead down steps and down through the uh, crepe myrtles uh, to our wedding site. And there's an arbor down there where the bride and groom and the priest are usually like here with our nonplussed cat Perkins too. <laughs> um, but sometimes uh, brides who have a lot of faith will uh, go without a tent. Like, and a, a seated dinner is now a very popular thing with a reception. Um, sometimes they'll have drinks in the garden or, or that view overlooking the river. Uh, these folks went without a tent like my daughter-in-law did and they have lighting makes you feel like you're in the room actually. It's pretty neat. Most go with a very nice tent and all that elaborate stuff. And then, of course, uh, this is a movie shoot with horses grazing on the, on the lawn. Um, the uh, producer of uh, Mercy Street came back, uh, and we, we were the filming location for a number of, uh, I think they call them hidden mysteries or uh, histories mysteries that the Smithsonian did a, a year ago. Many of the episodes for that were filmed in, uh, in Tucka, including the Indianapolis, remember the CO, uh, <coughs> court-martialed for not swerving the, the submarines enough, committed suicide. So one scene he stretched out in the south entrance hall of Tucko after he committed suicide. So we've had a lot, of, a lot of different things there. Turn was here recently. Some of you probably saw that on, I guess it was HBO. Um, so that was a big production. It's just amazing to see what those folks do. Even though we've never had a full, full feature film, some of these TV productions have, you know, trucks and we have a whole parking lot we call Base Camp where they park, and they have shuttles, and they, they literally have a hundred and some people, you know, doing all this stuff. We have uh, other events that we do. This is our tea and quilt event we have been having the last couple of years in April, where the uh, uh, local quilters guild come out. So that in their laundry, that was the quilt hanging out, <laughs> and uh, and they have tea, and it's a very nice event. They've got quilts on, and there's my dog Chloe. Um, so the quilt's hanging on the, on the railing there, and we give tours. Um, in the spring we have daffodils, we usually have a, something for Thomas Jefferson's birthday on April 13th, more daffodils. We have peony day, usually on Mother's Day, usually uh, they cooperate, although a couple of years ago it was so cold and late there were no peonies in bloom, and this, maybe this year they all bloom by the time we got to Mother's Day, so you, you never know. Um, the year before, the, this year it rained, so it wasn't so great, but the year before we had over 500 people picking in, on the grounds with the, our peony day. And then uh, looking at Tucko in the fall uh, with the nice leaves, we got a bunch of maple trees out in the front of the yard. <coughs> that uh, is one of the, uh, it, I think it was where one of the big, big production companies had their meals, so they usually invite us to join them for, and the unions make them have a lunch and a dinner, you sometimes at crazy hours depending on when they start or when they're going to finish. And there's the, 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 uh, the front gate and the real entrance lane, exit lane, which they faked in the story of Patriot, they borrowed a lane from somebody else. We have, that's the honor box where you're supposed to put your five dollars if you want to tour the grounds uh, on your own. And uh, there's, uh, we also have a big event in Halloween, we'll be having that uh, uh, the last Sunday in, in October this year. I think we had over 500 people for that and had good weather. 
this past year, um, we have, we've had uh, the collegiate and collegiate alums here. We have the collegiate oyster roast uh, um, at the end of October. Usually, we usually have four or five hundred, uh, mostly young people drinking beer, and mm -hmm. often we'll uh, double team it with the Capital Region Land Conservancy. I serve on that board. It promotes uh, conservation easements in the Richmond area and co-holds easement over the Jay River State Park. Um, I've been a good supporter. We recently bought Malvern Hill Farms and that to the Richmond Battlefield National Park eventually. Um, here we are decorated for Christmas. We, uh, that's a fixture that goes up uh, most Decembers and uh, we usually have a Christmas tour as part of that and the swags. You maybe saw the swags in the early picture on the, on the Great Hall steps, I mean, uh, on the North Entrance Hall steps. And here it's getting a little dusty of snow, <clears throat> and then lots of snow. Sometimes we'll have 14 inches at a, at a whack, uh, which makes it interesting getting in and out the, the, dirt, the dirt lane. There are the signs of Tucko Enterprises, which brings you the weddings and the tours. We uh, also have a horse boarding barn, and there it is. That's built in 1979. We have a wonderful uh, manager there who's been with us for almost 23 years. <coughs> and then in the brick barn, which you saw a piece of across the way, um, this is the building that was built by John Brokenburn in the early 19th century. The bank barn is now a, is a carpentry shop, and it's been that way since 1984 when Haley Pearsall moved in, and that was our first tax act we had. The second one, by the way, was the old stable. Uh, so we've done three of those, uh, thanks to uh, the federal and state laws and the Department of Historic Resources. And finally, um, <clears throat> one of the things that spurred us to uh, open Tuck out of the public was Route 288. <clears throat> um, I don't know if any of you have had occasion to drive around Richmond and had to go out of your way two miles uh, before you can connect back to 64. And we're the reason um, in the spring of 1970, um, the, the state in its wisdom, well, it was the perfect alignment with now it's Pocahontas Parkway, uh, was part of the um, uh, right away they'd already acquired a piece of it in Henrico. It's supposed to come right down the eastern boundary of Tucco and consume about 60 acres across the river right there. And uh, <coughs> they actually filed a taking, and my mother, Wellesley graduate, uh, was getting ready for a big reunion, went to lunch in Washington, D.C. with one of her classmates, and just so happened that her husband came along. He was none other than Lloyd Cutler, um, <clears throat> a big, uh, one of the super lawyers back in the uh, 60s and 70s. He said, as we came closer, you could see that there was this uh, woman, blonde woman, closer still, this beautiful blonde woman, and she held out her hand to him and said, here's a glass of cold water, drink this and you'll feel better in the morning. So he did, and he was completely cured. He went down to see his friends at breakfast the next morning. They were shocked to see him and said, well, what's, what's up? And he told him the story. And I guess his first wife um, was deceased by this time, I trust. But in any event, uh, he said, you know what? It was so good. If I ever see that woman again, I'm sure that I will recognize her. And I'm going to ask her to marry me. <laughs> well, a year or so later, he went to a big ball in uh, Patterson, New Jersey, where Lucinda Patterson was there, the daughter of the mayor, for whom the town was named, and he recognized her as the blonde woman in his bedroom and asked her to marry him and get married and happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little more sinister is the story of uh, Judith and Nancy, the bizarre sisters. You want me to keep going with that? Yeah. No. <laughs> you saw their names on that same day, March 16, 1789. Well, anyway, my mother died. Um, Judith had been had fallen in love with her first cousin, Richard Randolph of Bazaar. Believe it or not, that's the name of his house up near um, Farmville. And uh, <clears throat> remember, uh, mother had already had one daughter marry her first cousin when the um, when the pain was 2780. The party did turn out so well that the kind of innkeeper kind of a, you know, beneath the Randolphs, you know. So the story was she wasn't wild about uh, now Judith marrying her first cousin. And uh, so she was resisting this. And 
I don't know. It, and, you know, and they always say that the wedding ring was what they used to match on the, on the, the cut there when you match the glass with them. So my theory is that, uh, you know, Richard said, well, look, let's just surprise her. And uh, we'll show her the ring. So they show her the ring, and she collapses and dies. <laughs> <laughs> they take that uh, ring and write that date, March 16, 1789, <clears throat> on four windows in the house, including the bizarre sister's window that we saw in the episode of that moment. So um, Papa, being more of a traditionalist, <clears throat> let uh, Judith have her way, married Richard, and moved off to Bizarre. That left Nancy back home to take care of Papa. Well, she was quite a quite a, a lady, quite a gal, very accomplished, very organized. And it appears that she did such a good job running the household. And you gotta remember, you couldn't just push a button on the washing machine, or dishwasher, or whatever, you go to the store and get some milk, you had a cow milk to churn the butter and um, all that stuff. There was a washing pond about a quarter of a mile away. Um, she did such a good job that Papa was able to relax a little bit, so approaching 60 years old, he went downtown to go to courting, and uh, that's where he met uh, Gabriella Harvey, her dad very well connected as the sort of clerk of uh, Henry to Richmond, and he saw a good thing and, uh, and encouraged this match, and so it wasn't too long before, um, less than two years after Mama died, before Thomas Mann brought Gabriella Harvey back to Tucko as his second wife. She was all 18, barely a year older than her daughter Nancy, and was in that blue bedroom with the mantle. I told her she saved the mantle, but in, and of course lost the, uh, the war for Papa, and ended up moving out to travel around to Monticello, visit cousins, including Thomas Jefferson, and all of them. Finally, uh, <clears throat> um, was uh, in and out, and uh, she was. Uh, housekeeper, she became sort of a housekeeper for her sister Judith, and this happy uh, trio, Judith, Richard, and Nancy, by this time, uh, apparently Nancy had had an affair possibly with uh, Judith's husband, Richard, or maybe his brother, not quite sure, but anyway, they went to visit some other cousins in Cumberland County at the Glenlivar in the Glen's house, and uh, Nancy went straight up to Bed complaining of illness and wasn't seen for the rest of the night, except by an elderly aunt who peered through my keyhole to observe her through the stay in a straight a state of undress to be a child. time. But during the night, some strange noises, and there's called for water or towels and whatnot, and nothing. All was quiet until the there was some steps clumping down the staircase and out to the back door, and uh, <coughs> nothing much was said. Randolph's left for precipitously uh, until the corpse of an infant was found on the wood pile behind the house. So, it's uh, <clears throat> lucky they didn't have uh, better uh, NCIS and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because the, uh, you know, the corpse of the guy was buried and disappeared. But in any event, there was an a, 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 a inquiry in Cumberland County to see what happened that Richard mur murdered and uh, so the Randolphs were hoping this would clear their names, so they, they cooperated. They went out and hired a couple of good lawyers. Of course, Cousin John Marshall, maybe not the best orator, so they also engaged Patrick Henry. One of two cases were Patrick Henry and John Marshall, who were politically, uh, you know, poles apart politically, cooperated. And uh, the story goes that the aunt was on the stand and uh, talking about the keyhole, and for, I guess Patrick Henry was pretty desperate, you're not supposed to ask a question on cross-examination, with which, which eye did you pick through that keyhole? <laughs> of course, she couldn't remember, became so flustered that uh, the conclusion was that uh, Richard was innocent, and there never had been a pregnancy, <laughs> and so uh, the land also cleared, cleared. Nevertheless, poor Nancy, uh, all the rumors still circulated around, Obviously, she wasn't too welcome uh, in her sister's household anymore and couldn't get a job as a housekeeper in Virginia. So she had to go all the way to New York, where she took a job as housekeeper to Governor Morris, the architect of the, the editor of the Constitution, as we know today. And uh, they hit it off, and she and Governor Morris were married to the house after. Poor Judith, uh, she had two sons, and at least with her 
cousin, and maybe it's the reason why you don't marry a first cousin because at least one of them was a deaf mute and she was not very happy. Is buried in, the, in that uh, gateless uh, wall of cemetery at Takahau, uh, but it does have the consolation of having a chapter of the Daughters of American Revolution. So uh, there you have uh, the bizarre story.